Hello and welcome to our first background information video for CCI 228 Comparative World Drama. Today we're going to talk about the play Agamemnon, written by the playwright Aeschylus in 458 BCE and produced as a trilogy. The name of the trilogy is the Oresteia. It is in fact the only surviving trilogy that we have from the ancient world. So this is a very important play and one that will influence a lot of the ways that this story of Agamemnon is told going forward. So today we're going to talk about background information to Agamemnon's family, um, most importantly his father and his uncle, and then we're going to talk about important background information about the Trojan War, which will also um, explain and give some context to the action that's going to happen in the course of our play. So why don't we dive in? So we're going to start with a family tree uh, in what we typically call in Greek mythology the house of Atreus. So when you begin to study Greek mythology or Roman mythology um, more deeply, you'll notice how important genealogy, the, story, the study of families is uh, to mythological stories. The actions of parents continue to affect the lives of their children um, in most of these stories. So when we look to what is going on with our heroes of myth, we usually have to consider what their birth story was or um, how their parents acted or or some of the uh, fates or, or um, luck that has been following their parents around as part of the story for their children. So we're going to start with Atreus, who is Agamemnon's father. Uh, Atreus had a brother named Thyestes, and their father's name was Pelops. Now Pelops was the ruler of the city of Mycenae, or the city of Argos, depending on which story you're listening to. So for our story in Agamemnon, we're talking about the city of Argos. When Pelops dies, it's uncertain which of the brothers, Atreus or Thyestes, are going to become the king and they commit all sorts of atrocities against each other in their course of trying to win the throne. And that's actually a story that we'll read more in depth when we get to Roman tragedies, so I won't get into too many of the things that they do to each other, but I will focus on the most egregious sin. So at some point uh, in this story, Atreus captures Thyestes' three sons. So if you look beneath the name Thyestes, you see the three boys and his daughter Pelopea. Atreus captures these boys, kills them, cuts them up into little pieces, and then cooks them. And he serves it at a dinner that is supposed to be a reconciliation dinner for him and Thyestes. And when Thyestes recognizes what it is that he's eating, uh, he is so distraught and so destroyed that he just cedes the throne to Atreus and leaves Argos. Now, cannibalism was a taboo back then, just like it is today. So the gods are not pleased with Atreus, and they put a curse on his family. And this begin, continues to play out in successive generations, and we'll come back to that, of course, when we read the play. Now, if you look right beneath uh, Thyestes' name, you see Pelopea has a little plus, and someone beneath her named Aegisthus. And that means that Thyestes slept with his own daughter, Pelopea, and had another son named Aegisthus. So you'll want to remember Aegisthus' name because he will pop up again at the end of our story. Okay, so let's move on to Agamemnon's generation. So this is Agamemnon and his brother, Menelaus. So these guys actually have a very good relationship. They are not competitive for the throne. Um, Agamemnon is the elder brother, so he becomes the ruler of Argos, and he's looking around for opportunities for Menelaus to become a political player in other areas of Greece. Um, Menelaus eventually uh, gets uh, interested in a woman named Helen, and everyone in Greece is interested in Helen. She's the most beautiful woman. She's actually uh, semi-divine. She's a daughter of Zeus. Uh, but her beauty is such that it's completely captivating, and all of the most important kings and warriors of Greece want to marry her. 
Now her father, Tyndarius, recognizes that this is an opportunity for him to make a very advantageous match. And he also recognizes how dangerous it is, it is to have all of these really strong, powerful men milling around his home, becoming more and more threatening, waiting for him to make a choice about who's going to marry his, wife, his daughter. So he enlists the help of a man named Odysseus, who is famous for his cunning. And Odysseus proposes a solution where they're actually going to draw lots. So basically like a lottery ticket to determine who is going to marry Helen. But before they draw the name, all of the men who want to marry her have to swear that no matter who wins, they will all come to his aid if ever they need him. All right. So if um, Helen should, something bad should happen to Helen or if something bad should happen to Helen's husband, all of these powerful kings, all of these powerful warriors will have to band together uh, to make sure that the right is made wrong. And that is called the Oath of Tyndarius. So all of the suitors agree to this. Um, now, somehow, we'll say Agamemnon managed to rig the competition so that Menelaus, his younger brother, wins the hand of Helen. So Agamemnon, the ruler of Argos, marries Helen's sister. Her name is Clytemnestra. Right, so Agamemnon and Clytemnestra rule in Argos. Menelaus and Helen rule in Sparta. And they have become extremely powerful and now have control of two major city-states. So this is when we get to talk a little bit more about who Helen was. So if Helen of Sparta doesn't sound as familiar to you, you might be more familiar with Helen of Troy. So Helen is often considered to be the cause of the Trojan War. So the reason that this comes to be is because of an event called the Judgment of Paris. Paris was a lowly shepherd uh, who lived in the mountains uh, of Turkey that surrounded a very powerful city named Troy. Uh, one day when Paris is out on his mountain with his sheep, the god Hermes, who is depicted with winged sandals or a winged helmet, he's the messenger god, shows up carrying three goddesses, Aphrodite, the goddess of lust and sex, Hera, um, the goddess of marriage, who is also married to Zeus, and Athena, the goddess of wisdom and warfare. And he hands Paris a golden apple. On the apple are written the words, to the fairest, or to the most beautiful. And he tells Paris that he has to decide between the goddesses which of them is the most beautiful. All of the goddesses begin to offer Paris some bribes. So Hera offers him political power, Athena offers him military powder, power, and Aphrodite offers the most beautiful woman in the world. Now, Paris had a bit of a reputation for being something of a womanizer, and he chooses the most beautiful woman in the world. Now, unfortunately, at the time, the most beautiful woman in the world, Helen, happened to be married to Menelaus. So Aphrodite sets up a situation in which Paris can meet Helen and take her away with him back to his hometown. Now, whether she goes willingly or unwillingly depends on the story that you're reading. And what you're looking at here are three different representations of the Judgment of Paris. On the bottom left there, you have um, a Greek vase painting from the 5th century CE, which is closer to when the play itself was written. On the right, we have a painting by Cranach the Elder from the Renaissance, where you can see that they've updated the men's clothing to, you know, sort of indicate what time period that we're looking at, whereas the women have been stripped of their clothing. And on the top left, we have a painting by Peter Paul Rubens in the early Baroque period of um, the same event happening again. You can see uh, the women are becoming more and more nude, uh, whereas the men get to remain clothed. So back to our story. As it turns out, Paris is not just some lowly shepherd. Uh, but he is in fact the long lost son of the king of Troy. His name is Priam and his wife's name is Hecuba. Paris actually has many, many siblings. Priam supposedly has 50 kids and he is welcomed back into the royal family um, as a very important prince of Troy, which means Helen is welcomed into the royal family as a princess of Troy. So Paris's famous siblings, um, the most recognizable of which is probably Hector, 
who is a famous warrior. He's considered the most powerful um, and most dutiful, most moral, most upright of Priam's sons. Um, another one who's important is his sister, Cassandra. Uh, Cassandra and her husband, or not her husband, I'm sorry, Cassandra and her brother, Helenus, uh, both have the gift of prophecy. They can see the future. And Cassandra will also have a role to play as our story continues. So Helen has been whisked away to Troy. She is now Helen of Troy. And we now have a situation in which all of the suitors for her hand who have taken this oath must now make good on their oath. Menelaus needs them to come and help him bring his wife back. So all of these famous kings, all of these famous warriors muster an army. And even though it is Menelaus, who is Helen's husband in the wrong party, Agamemnon, his older brother, his more powerful brother, becomes the general and the leader of the army. So all of the men are mustered at a city called Aulis, which is on the coast, and they're getting ready to sail across the Aegean Sea to go to Troy. And while they're waiting, Agamemnon heads out to go hunting to get some to get some meat for himself and for his men. And he manages to kill this really spectacular deer. And depending on the story, this deer is either a sacred deer, an important deer to Artemis, the goddess of the hunt, or it's just a regular deer. But Agamemnon makes a terrible mistake. And he is so pleased with the shot that he made that he says something like, not even Artemis herself could have made that shot. Oh, that was a big mistake. You should never, ever boast like that about the gods. You should never compare yourself to the gods. But Agamemnon did that. And so Artemis punishes him by making the winds go calm, which means that the men can't sail across the sea to go to Troy. The war, you know, the war expedition is stalled, and we've got all of these big, powerful egos and kings and warriors just milling around, waiting for the wind to blow, um, getting more and more restless and causing more and more trouble. Agamemnon doesn't know what to do, so he consults his priest, who interprets the acts of the gods and the, the will of the gods for him, and the priest tells him that in order for the winds to blow again, Agamemnon must sacrifice his daughter. So now we need to go back to Agamemnon's family. Agamemnon has th uh, three children with Clytemnestra, Iphigenia, his oldest daughter, Electra, his second daughter, and Orestes, who is his son. The priest tells Agamemnon that he has to kill Iphigenia as a sacrifice in order for the winds to blow again. So Agamemnon has to make a terrible decision about whether or not he kills his daughter and angers his wife, his family, himself in committing this crime, or if he lets the wind stay calm and completely scuttles the whole expedition to Troy. And Agamemnon chooses to kill his daughter. So he lures Iphigenia to Aulis on the pretense that she's going to be married to one of the famous warriors of, um, of, of Greece named Achilles, and we'll talk more about him very soon. His wife Clytemnestra comes with her thinking that she's going to be there to watch her daughter get married. Um, but of course, when they arrive, um, the truth comes out and Agamemnon must kill Iphigenia, which he does. And we have some very famous representations of this, most uh, famously perhaps um, a wall painting from the Roman city of Pompeii, where you can see Agamemnon on the left not watching as his men and the priest uh, drag his daughter away and Artemis on the top right watches with her stag, um, her, her sacred deer on the left. Uh, this action, of course, is going to have long-term consequences. So on the one hand, they do manage to go to Troy. Uh, but on the other hand, um, when Agamemnon returns, he finds an incredibly angry wife uh, who has lost her daughter. And so the play will conclude with Clytemnestra taking revenge on her husband, and not only on her husband, but also on Cassandra. If you remember Cassandra, the prophetess, um, the seer, the daughter of Priam, um, when the city of Troy falls, 
At the end of the war, she is taken back to Greece as a captive, and we'll get into that a little bit more. So this is a quick introduction to Agamemnon. Uh, we'll review a little bit more, and we'll watch some clips.